Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Adrienne Adams, and welcome to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Sighting, and Dispositions. Today, we are joined by Council Members Barron, Koo, and Lander. We will hold public hearings on five individual landmarks located in Brooklyn Community District 6 and designated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission in connection with the administration's proposed Gowanus rezoning. LU-597 is the landmark designation of the Somers Brothers Tinware Factory, later known as the American Can Company, located at 361 through 363 3rd Avenue, Block 980, part of Lot 8. LU-598 is the landmark designation of the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company Central Power Station Engine House, located at 153 2nd Street, Block 967, part of Lot 1. LU-599 is the landmark designation of the Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company building located at 172nd Avenue, Block 1025, Lot 49. LU's 497, 498, and 5, I'm sorry, LU's 597, 598, and 599 are all located in the council district represented by council member Lander. LU-600 is the landmark designation of the Gowanus Flushing Tunnel Pumping Station and Gatehouse, located at 201 Douglas Street, Block 411, Lot 14. LU-601 is the landmark designation of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, Brooklyn Office, Shelter and Garage Building, located at 233 Butler Street, Block 405, part of Lot 51, including a portion of the sidewalk in front of Lot 51. LU 600 and 601 are located in the council district represented by council member Levin. We will now have remarks by council member Brad Lander. Thank you very much, Chair Adams, and Happy New Year. It's wonderful to be here with you and Councilmember Barron and Ku. Thanks to the committee staff uh, and to the Landmarks Preservation Commission as well. This is really a good day. We are still. Um, uh, well ahead of the anticipated certification of the Gowanus rezoning, and we are already at the City Council on the landmarking of these five really historic sites. Gowanus is a neighborhood rich in history, especially in industrial history, but a wide range of history. And we're lucky to have this beautiful industrial built environment, and it is critical, therefore, that we uh, preserve and strengthen and make sure it continues strongly into the future. Uh, out in front of uh, uh, the Gowanus rezoning process to think about how we also achieve inclusive, affordable mixed income housing and other open space and business uses in what is really a great neighborhood and can be a continued mixed use neighborhood and a much more inclusive one than the one we have today. That really means working hard to get the balance right. Uh, and that's why I want to thank the Landmarks Preservation Commission for coming to us ahead of time. I also really want to thank the advocates here, the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition, uh, Park Slope Civic Council, Historic Districts Council have been very strong advocates in pushing hard to make this happen out front. Um, and I also want to note that thinking about how we get both a mixed use and a mixed income Gowanus is a big broad challenge of which historic preservation and landmarking is one element. We know though that it's not enough alone to preserve these beautiful industrial buildings. We also want to preserve some of the uses that are in there which create jobs, blue collar jobs for working people. And we're trying very hard in the rezoning to make sure both in these developments that will be landmarking but also in some of the new developments that we are really thoughtful about preserving the light industrial, arts, artisan, manufacturing, and nonprofit uses that make Gowanus a really compelling place. And as a new community develops there, that it is genuinely uh, an inclusive one. Right now, you know, it's almost exclusively um, a, a upper middle income neighborhood, largely a white one. There's some public housing nearby that needs to be preserved and strengthened also through this rezoning. And the neighborhood that results has to be more diverse, more affordable, more integrated without displacement. <laughs> 
And that is the goal we'll be having in the coming months as the rezoning starts to get to the council uh, after certification, which we anticipate sometime this quarter most likely. But this is a great place to be starting because we're preserving history as we start to move forward to think about the balance for the future. So I want to, you know, just one more time, that's taken a lot of people to get us here, a lot of advocacy, a lot of work by the city, a lot of shaping of the values of the development of the future of the city on this council. Um, it's not yet, it hasn't been easy to get here, it won't be easy to get further, but because of all that work a wide range of stakeholders have been doing, um, I think we have a chance to get this right, and I really feel very grateful uh, to everybody who has been pushing so hard so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Lander. Thank you for all of your hard work as well in getting us here today. Thank you. I now open the public hearings on LUs 597, 598, 599, 600, and 601. We're joined today by representatives of LPC. Kate Lemos McHale. Hi, Kate. And Anthony, Anthony Farver. Okay, before you begin, council will swear you in. Please raise your right hands and state your names. Kate Lemus McHale. Anthony Fabre. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? I do. I do. Begin. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and subcommittee members and Council Member Lander. I am Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Thank you for the opportunity pres to present these five landmarks designated in the Gowanus area of Brooklyn. On October 29th, 2019, LPC designated the five buildings shown here, the Summers Brothers Tinware Factory, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, Central Power Station Engine House, the Gowanus Canal Flushing Tunnel Pumping Station and Gatehouse, the Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company Building, and the ASPCA Brooklyn Office Shelter and Garage as individual landmarks. These designations, as the council member noted, were the result of LPC's Gowanus Initiative, which I will describe in the next few slides. They were found meritorious for designation due to their combination of their prominence within the neighborhood, their notable architectural character and integrity, and their historic connections to the canal and the industries and organizations that developed around it in the late 19th and early 20th century. Their designation recognizes and celebrates the unique character of the canal and the Gowanus. Um, they have adapted over time and remain the area's most prominent architecturally distinctive and historically significant buildings. The agency worked closely with the property owners and received strong support for these designations. They were the result of a multiple year effort by LPC through its Gowanus initiative to study the Gowanus area, which has a rich history and has seen tremendous change over time. The canal's designation as a Superfund site in 2010 and Superstorm Sandy in 2012 brought particular attention to the, um, the need to remediate and improve infrastructure in the Gowanus and to develop a plan for the neighborhood's future. As part of the administration's multi-agency planning process, LPC worked closely with the Department of City Planning, key stakeholders, and community members. Uh, LPC staff participated in the Public Realm Working Group as a part of this process. It met several times in 2017 and 2018 to really understand the needs of the community, to inform the planning process, and to identify preservation opportunities in the neighborhood in advance of the rezoning. Uh, as part of LPC's Gowanus in initiative, staff undertook a comprehensive and detailed study of the entire neighborhood, including the planned rezoning area, but also the industrial area to the south, um, to identify potential landmarks. We developed a framework defining the major periods of development of the Gowanus neighborhood um, to guide and inform evaluation of historic structures that best represent that history. To illustrate this framework and our study, I'd like to summarize the development history and then give you a brief um, presentation on each of the landmarks. The Gowanus Canal was preceded by the Gowanus Creek, shown here in the 1766 map. Prior to European settlement, 
um, the area was inhabited by members of the Canarsie tribe, and the area's Native American history was tied very strongly to its original ecology. Later, the Gowanus area played a key role in the Battle of Long Island, also called the Battle of Brooklyn, which was the first major battle of the, universe, uh, of the Revolutionary War and the largest battle ever waged in North America up to that time. First proposed in the 1840s, the Gowanus Canal runs from the Gowanus Bay to its terminus just south of Butler Street and was completed after the Civil War in 1869. Shown here is the outline of the canal in its full ex extent from 1942, overlaid over an 1839 map of the creek. The man-made canal transformed this natural creek and estuary into one of the country's first planned industrial districts. The canal's construction, coinciding with tremendous growth in Brooklyn, spurred development of a range of industries, um, all really relying on the waterborne freight and the area was a major entry and distribution point for building materials. The canal and adjacent businesses were most active in the 1900s, uh, in the early 1900s. In the 1920s, vessels moved more than $100 million worth of goods each year, making it one of the world's most productive and valuable waterways. It also became highly polluted. Most canal side businesses were housed in wood frame structures that no longer survive. Of buildings that do survive from this period, two that particularly stand out are the immense brick engine room of the BRT, um, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, and the Summers Brothers Tinware Factory, which are shown here, uh, both of which depended on canal side locations and are included in this group of landmarks. Following World War II, there was a decline in industrial activity in the area, and many businesses closed or downsized. Over the past 30 years, light industrial and commercial activity has grown in the area, and it's been, become a hub for creative industries and artists, many of whom have reactivated former industrial and manufacturing buildings. Okay, so here's our first landmark. Uh, the Summers Brothers Tinware Factory. Located at the intersection of 3rd Street and 3rd Avenue, this distinctive factory was built in 1884 for the largest decorated tinware firm in the country at the time. At the public hearing on September 24th, the commission received support for the proposed designation from 14 people, including representatives of the property owner, New York City Council Member Brad Lander, the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition, Historic Districts Council, Society for the Architecture of the City, New York Landmarks Conservancy, Park Slope Civic Council, Friends and Residents of Greater Gowanus, Municipal Art Society, and four individuals. No one spoke in opposition. And in addition, the commission received 33 written submissions in support of designation. And just so you know and to um, relieve us of some repetition, um, th this same testimony really applies to all of them, and so I'm not going to keep repeating it each time. Oh. Uh, in a time before plastics and aluminum cans, tin plate containers made the consumption of a wide range of products possible. In 1878, Summers Brothers firm began to use a lithographic process to print images on tin plate sheets and custom equipment to cut and shape the sheets into containers. This set Summers Brothers apart as the first known American producers of decorated tinware. Daniel Summers designed the factory and invented many of the machines and processes used within. Much of his factory design was functional, typical of late 19th century industri industrial architecture, but it was also expressive, with a remarkable variety of brick patterns and arrangements that enliven the facades and a mixture of arched windows characteristic of the American round arch style. In 1901, Summers Brothers was absorbed by the American Can Company, which became the largest producer of kin tin cans in the world, and made many innovations, including the country's first usable beer cans. The American Can Company sold the building in 1950, and by the 1970s, uh, the factory had become a creative node in the Gowanus. Today, it's used by more than 300 artists, performers, designers, fabricators, publishers, nonprofit organizations, and an iconic music studio. Known as the Old American Can Factory, it led the Gowanus neighborhood's transition from industry to a lively mix of arts and manufacturing, and remains a vital contributor to the historic and architectural character of the neighborhood. <coughs> 
It remains remarkably intact to its time as a major manufacturing presence in Gowanus and is one of the area's most distinctive buildings. The landmark site is shown here on the right as a lot in part that includes the original 1884 structure, which is also shown at the historic atlas on the left. The former BRT, Central Power Station Engine House, is a monumental link to the Gowanus Canal's industrial past and a significant structure in the development of mass transit in New York City. It is located on the east side of the Gowanus Canal near the intersection of 3rd Avenue and 2nd Street. At its public hearing on September 24th, in addition to the support I previously listed, the commission also received support from a representative of the owner of the Powerhouse Environmental Arts Foundation. The Central Power Station was built in 1901 to 04 by the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company. This complex consolidated power generating operations for Brooklyn's various lines on a single site, marking the company's emergence as one of the country's largest transit providers and making an important step toward the creation of an integrated mass transit system. The original site extended um, from the 1st Street Basin to 3rd Street and from the 3rd Avenue to the canal where barges delivered coal directly to the power station. At the time of completion, the BRT power station consisted of two main blocks shown here, a north section demolished before 1950, which served as the boiler room, and the surviving engine house indicated with red arrows. The engine house remained in operation, providing electric power to the 4th Avenue subway until 1972. The monumental BRT Central Power Station engine house is a prominent reminder of the era when the Gowanus Canal was a significant inland waterway and the Gowanus neighborhood was a major industrial center. The three original facades are bold yet restrained, gaining much of their impact from the structure's immense size, simple massing, and multi-story window openings, and incorporating expressive brick details which remain intact. In its current form since the mid-20th century, the building is a significant presence in the Gowanus neighborhood, um, gaining significance on its own and known colloquially as the Bat Cave. In 2012, the former BRT Central Power Station engine house was acquired by the Powerhouse Environmental Arts Foundation, which plans to reuse and rehabilitate the structure and construct an annex on the north side. The site conditions have changed through the 20th century and the landmark site is a lot in part incorporating the land beneath the engine house. The Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company building, located at the corner of 13th Street and 2nd Avenue, reflects the industrial history of the Gowanus neighborhood and stands out for its simple yet refined design and high level of integrity. Uh, at the public hearing held on September 24th, uh, this building received the testimony that I've already described. Supporting designation. The Montauk Paint Manufacturing Building was historically located on a super block stretching between 2nd Avenue and the canal. It was built as an investment property in 1908 by the Brooklyn Alcatraz Asphalt Company's President William Kelly. The first tenant of the new factory building was the Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company, incorporated in 1908, who remained in the building for more than 20 years. The Brooklyn Eagle noted at the time that the borough of Brooklyn was one of the foremost paint manufacturing centers in the United States. In the mid-20th century, Norge sailmakers moved into the building. The Norge Sailmakers Company manufactured yacht and sailboat sails as well as covers for pleasure crafts and showcased the building in their advertisements. The building was designed in a simplified version of the American round arch style by Garibed George Heninian, excuse me. A civil engineer, he utilized sophisticated brickwork and established a clear expression of the building structure to create an elegant design. The distinguished design of this building lends to its prominence within the industrial Gowanus neighborhood and it is remarkably intact. Located at the head of the Gowanus Canal and completed in 1911, the Gowanus Canal Flushing Tunnel Pumping Station and Gatehouse were part of a major infrastructure project intended to clean the increasingly polluted water of the canal. They were designed in a monumental neoclassical style, elevating their function, and are little changed from their original appearance. 
at the public hearing on September 24th. In addition to the supportive testimony I've described, the Landmarks Commission also received support for designation from the owner, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. The original plan to maintain the water quality in the Gowanus Canal relied on the ebb and flow of tides, but it was soon determined that this was insufficient for the task. As the canal received increasing amounts of industrial waste and runoff from sanitary and stormwater sewers, the city of Brooklyn purchased the lots at the head of the canal, including part of the canal, in 1890. In 1904, the Bureau of Sewers for the Borough of Brooklyn proposed construction of a 6,280-foot-long tunnel linking the canal to Buttermilk Channel. A nine-foot propeller would move the dirty water from the canal and replace it with cleaner water from the bay. And you can see, I think this drawing is incredible, showing the, the length of that tunnel. Um, okay, next. In 1909, work on the Flushing Tunnel had been completed and Arthur L. L. Martin of the Bureau of Sewers submitted applications for construction of the two buildings to house the pumping equipment. They were completed in 1911, and in June of that year, the residents of South Brooklyn celebrated the opening of the new works that promised to improve the canal's condition. Executed in red brick and limestone, the Gowanus Canal Flushing Tunnel Pumping Station and Gatehouse reflect the monumental classicism favored for civic structures of the time. The pumping station on the right housed the tunnel's pumping equipment and northern sluice gate. The smaller gatehouse shown on the left was built to protect the tunnel's southern sluice gate. The Gowanus Canal flushing tunnel opened, operated until the 1960s when the propeller mechanism broke. DEP reactivated in 1999 after a five-year renovation, which included reversing the flow of water to bring oxygen oxygenated water from Buttermilk Channel into the canal. The tunnel was again rehabilitated from 2009 to 2014. The image on the right from the New York Times illustrates this renovation and the physical relationship of the tunnel with the pumping station and gatehouse. The image on the left shows the complex in 2013. The landmark site is outlined in red. It includes the portion of the tax lot on which these two historic buildings are located. Um, it does not include DEP's new service building on Butler Street. And finally, upon its opening in 1913, this building at 233 Butler Street in Gowanus was hailed as the largest, most complete animal shelter in the world. It was originally constructed as the Brooklyn Dog and Cat Shelter of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and is the finest surviving ASPCA building in New York City. At the public hearing on September 24th, the Commission received support along with the other five landmarks, um, and in addition we heard support from a representative of the property owner. Originally constructed in 1913, the building was just a single story in height, occupying only the western portion of its lot, as shown on the left. Renovations in 1922 enlarged it to its current size, expanding its shelter capacity and expanding it into the ASPCA's headquarters and ambulance house. The ASPCA building is located across Butler Street from the head of the Gowanus Canal. The historic map on the right shows the site in 1921, just before the shelter building was expanded to its present size. The ASPCA has been headquartered in New York City since its founding by Henry Berg in 1866, and Berg is shown on the right coming to the aid of overworked horses in this image. Before its founding, animals enjoyed few legal protections. The ASPCA was crucial in revolu revolutionizing Americans' attitudes towards animals and in establishing New York as a national leader in the humane movement. The elegant neo-Romanesque style design of the Butler Street facade by the firm of Renwick, Aspinwall, and Tucker is a testament to the organization's civic and social importance. Two large arch arches, one of which served as an ambulance portal, dominate a facade enlivened by molded and patterned brickwork and limestone trim. Changes on the main facade are essentially limited to window sash and door replacement. Um, 
As shown by this group of Girl Scouts assembled in front of the building in the 1920s, the building played an important role in educating Brooklynites in the care and humane treatment of animals. And thousands of Brooklynites adopted pets here. The ASPCA was a leader in hiring female ambulance drivers, including th um, three working here in 1924, who were thought to be more tactful than men in dealing with the delicate situations often faced by ASPCA staff. Bronze medals were awarded here to heroic Brooklyn animals, including Mickey the Irish Setter, who saved his family from a fire. The sidewalk in front of the building retains a granite watering trough dating from its opening. Dozens of similar troughs were installed throughout New York City by anti-cruelty advocates to provide horses with drinking water, and this is one of few that remain in the city. The trough and the building behind it, the finest, best-preserved ASPCA building remaining in New York, constitute a unique monument to a time when working animals filled the city streets and to New York's central role in the nationwide anti-cruelty movement. The existing tax lot does not correspond with the historic lot, and so the landmark site includes the building and the sidewalk in front of it, including the watering trough. Um, and with that, I conclude and thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. You know, it's, it's days like this and hearings like this that just give me such a warm fuzzy about the history of this, of this great city. Just, so just to hear the stories, and, and Kate, you do them so well, it just really takes me back, you know, it takes me to a nice storytelling place, you know, so, so that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, in Councilmember Lander's uh, remarks, he referenced some of these buildings that are still uh, functional. Can you just give us a rundown once again, which, which, of, these, which of these buildings are still functional and hours of operation? If any. Sure, yes. Yeah. The, well, the American Can Company building um, is a, a place for artists and artisans to work. And so it is functional, you know, through the day and into the night. Um, the BRT power ha engine house is in the process of being renovated for also um, a mixed use of artist artistic fabrication and other uses. Um, and so that will really be. Um, the use there, it's been vacant for many, many years, and so this new use will really reinvigorate that building. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection uses the pump house still. It's, it's, it's still part of the canal flushing system. Um, it's not open to the public to visit, but it is an active building. Um, and we the, could get the chair in if she wants to. Yeah, she wants yeah. To. It's a great tour, I have to say. That's one of my favorite Gowanus sites. Yeah. Um, I have to do that. Um, <laughs> And then the ASPCA building is currently in use. It has a, a coffee house, a cafe, and it has kind of a nightclub. So that's active during the day and the evening. Um, and then the Montauk Paint Factory building um, is owned by an artist, and he uses it as his studio. Pretty fascinating stuff, and I, I just might take you up on that offer for the tour. It sounds amazing. Uh, I'd also like to just announce we have been joined by Council Members Miller and Traeger. And uh, Council Members, uh, do you have any questions for the panel? Council Member Lander? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And I'll, I'll try not to go on and on forever as much as I, you know I could. Um, so uh, just one thing I think it's worth, uh, you know, I, I, on my first term in the council, I sat on this uh, committee and chaired this subcommittee and really enjoyed it. Um, but I'm not here as frequently. And I know one thing that is somewhat uh, unique here is, you know, having this set of five industrial sites. This is, you know, not the typical landmarks package that comes. Usually it's wonderful residential buildings. I just wonder... Um, you know, is this, uh, yeah, obviously this was in part done because we're looking at, you know, a broader plan and changes in Gowanus, but uh, is this part of some broader efforts to preserve the industrial history of the city? How does this fit in with, you know, the LPC's thinking uh, on those issues? Thank you. Well, it is part of our efforts to be involved in neighborhoods undergoing change, and so I think the, the, um, the Gowanus initiative that we took part of along with the, the broader initiative, was very important in terms of identifying potential landmarks, and in particular, of this industrial character to really preserve that historic character here as the neighborhood undergoes change. Um, we do look throughout the city at, at various neighborhoods. Um, 
and we do want to represent, you know, all of the important eras of development, types of development, types of architecture. And so, in part, it's also part of that broader initiative that we are, you know, always trying to achieve, you know, the best representation of the city's historic buildings. Um, and then I want to talk about two things. So first, I want to say one more time. Now that you're, you know, in the in the witness chair, thank you. That a lot of work has gone in being responsive to the community um, and doing a lot of work on each of these, and especially moving to a place where the building owners were supportive. So the whole community really is out uh, supportively here. And no tool that I'm aware of, other than landmarking could preserve these buildings amidst change. So that is really significant. Um, at the same time, there's two other things I think we hope to do in preserving the historic and mixed use character of the neighborhood that are less directly in the toolkit of the LPC, but on which I know we're working together. So I just kind of in a certain way want to let my colleagues know about them and the public know about them. Um, as I mentioned and the chair affirmed, part of our goal here is not only to preserve the structures, but see their uses transformed, actually not far away at 2nd Avenue and 9th Street. We have some historic buildings, uh, which are not being designated, but are old, nice buildings, but which were um, about two years ago, all of the artists that were in them were evicted, and the landlord is bringing in retail and office, and the structures will be preserved, but the mixed-use character, the more blue-collar jobs, the history, the character of the neighborhood, um, less so. So we are working together in all of these sites in different ways to achieve that uh, preservation. Some are easy. The Flushing Tunnel is going to continue to be a critical piece of infrastructure in the, in the city. Um, the one that I think bears a little conversation uh, is the one in the upper left of these pictures, the American Can Factory, the old uh, tin, tin can factory, as you, as you talked about, where this designation will preserve the buildings um, but those 300 small artists and artisans and light manufacturers obviously will not be preserved in there as a result of the building preservation. And so a, a, a project is underway or an effort is underway, including the LPC, including city planning, including the building owner, to think about an approach to the um, uh, redevelopment and ad adaptive reuse of that property that provides a good incentive to the owner to preserve that mix of uses and businesses. Um, paired with a development plan that was shown to the community um, and that there is also maybe not as unanimous a support as for the landmarking, but pretty broad support for something that would allow on the back part of the site some residential uh, development with affordable housing, MIH, and the preservation not only of those beautiful historic structures, but of the types of light manufacturing arts and artisan businesses that characterize them. So. Um, you know, I, I appreciate LPC's involvement in that. I just, um, on this issue of trying to figure out how to use both the tools of landmarking, but also thinking about preservation of uses, I wonder if that's, you know, if this is a model, if you have other thoughts that are worth sharing. I, I really appreciate the landmarking tool, but obviously we want to get the balance as best we can. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, as we know, designation of buildings doesn't impact the use, and so that's not something that's under our purview. Um, but in the case where there is this, you know, multi-agency, multi-faceted effort, um, I think that was something that was considered throughout this, is really areas that have this industrial character and have this mix of uses, how can that continue? And so I think to the degree that we can designate, you know, meritorious landmarks. We're really proud of this collection. Um, and I think preserving overall the character and really trying to find ways to promote the adaptive reuse is, is an important part. Thank you. And then my last question similarly is about um, extending how we think about what we preserve and how we tell those stories. These are wonderful buildings from this industrial history part of the neighborhood, such a critical part, and the best part built into the built environment. But as your story uh, said at the beginning, you know, there's a Lenape Native American history for which we don't have structures. There's a Revolutionary War history for which we don't have structures. And then um, there was actually just an exhibit in Gowanus about redlining and um, issues of kind of historic urban renewal and discrimination and kind of the racist and segregationist 
uh, paths of our history, which also played out in, in Gowanus. That's not something we want to preserve in the built environment, but it's an important part of the story to tell. So um, per city planning's uh, draft Gowanus plan and our work together, we've been working on the possibility of doing, in addition to these building preservations, some kind of uh, historic trail or set of markers so that as we're moving forward in the neighborhood, we can not only tell the stories of the extant uh, buildings, but also that broader sense of history and try to learn its lessons and bring its positive values forward and also learn from its mistakes. So you've said this to me privately, but I'll just ask you on the record, uh, even though that's not, a, again, a tool of the LPC, as we move forward and try to figure that out um, in the rezoning, can we count on working together with you uh, to knit the LPC tools together with broader ways of preserving and telling the stories of Gowanus history and connecting people to them. Yeah, I mean, we do try to do a lot of work to promote the understanding of an area's history and the buildings that represent it. And so I think what we've pulled together in terms of, um, and what you know we wanted to include because we thought was important, this overall history of the Gowanus and these eras that form the framework of its development history but are not, as you say, represented by existing structures. It's still part of that historic context that creates what the place is today. And so finding ways to, you know, bring that into um, the, the way that someone can experience the neighborhood today, especially as it changes, is great. And we, I hope you've all seen, we recently um, put out a story map that talked about New York City's abolitionist her history and, um, and our and activity related to the Underground Railroad as represented in um, landmarks where this history is documented. And so this is the type of um, educational tool that we really like to do. And so I, th I think that would be great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Lander. Thank you very much for your testimony, as always, and bringing us this great history today. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we do have another panel coming up. We're going to call uh, Peter Bray, Park Slope Civic Council. And we will call our friend Simeon Bancroft as well, Historic Districts Council. You may begin. I'm Peter Gray, and I represent the Park Slope Civic Council as the chair of its Historic District Committee. I'm here today to urge the City Council to ratify the five uh, Gowanus buildings uh, designated on October 29th by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Uh, the Civic Council has been a forceful advocate throughout the Gowanus rezoning process for the protection of the area's history, diversity, and unique industrial character. There is no other place quite like Gowanus in New York City. Uh, to ensure that these concerns were heard, the Civic Council helped to found the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition, and I am here today also speaking on its behalf. Um, I do not intend to address each of the five buildings. Um, I think that the LPC has made a clear case for their significance. Uh, but I do want to say th that um, they unquestionably deserve to be landmarks. Um, in addition to their architectural character, they represent significant aspects of Gowanus's history, uh, whether powering the transportation modes of the day or using the Gowanus Canal to produce and ship goods. Uh, the Gowanus pumping station buildings continue to be vital to the safe operation of the canal. Uh, it is important to note that the owners of the four private buildings, and as we heard today, uh, the city's environmental um, 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 Department of Environmental Protection have also uh, testified in favor of their uh, designation. Um, 
While we appreciate the LPC's efforts to protect these buildings, I ask that the subcommittee view this action only as a starting point and not the end of the Gowanus landmarking process. The LPC informed the coalition in writing uh, that it will continue to assess several other buildings. The coalition submitted to the LPC a list, a list of 18 priority buildings. It is our concern that once these five buildings are approved, the LPC will not return to address the other buildings that also contributed significantly to Gowanus's role in the development of Brooklyn. So yes, please endorse the designation of these five deserving buildings, but please also uh, use your influence uh, in the public interest to press the LPC to do more in Gowanus. Its work in Gowanus is not done. The completion of the area's rezoning will inevitably eradicate its remaining character with a wave of development, so further action in protecting its architectural and historical character is imperative. I want to thank the subcommittee for hearing my comments, and I also want to thank uh, Council Member Lander, who I know is uh, committed to um, extending the landmarking process and, and, and pushing to get more buildings uh, protected in that area. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Council Members. Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic District Council. Happy 2020. Happy New Decade. Um, HTC is the advocate for New York City's de designated historic districts. We've been working in Gowanus since 2011 when we featured it as one of our first initial uh, the first round of our six to celebrate neighborhoods. Um, this year's one of this year's six to celebrate neighborhoods, by the way, is the Center Slope. So that's uh, we're going to be working with Peter again. It's in your district, Councilmember Lander. Uh, at the time, we worked closely with the community group, the Friends and Residents of Greater Gowanus, who had formed in response to immense real estate pressure, res resulting in the erosion of their neighborhood character through demolitions of significant historic buildings, gentrification, and tenant and resident displacement, as well as environmental concerns. As a result of our collaboration, a historic resources survey was completed, and Gowanus was determined eligible for the National Register of Historic Places with the New York State Historic Historic Preservation Office's full support in 2013. Throughout 2014 2015, we participated in Councilman Berlander's Bridging Gowanus project, submitted a statement that called for historic preservation to be part of any future comprehensive neighborhood plan, which it is. We're pleased to see. In fact, the final Bridging Gowanus report references our Gowanus guidebook, which I should have brought to, should have thought to bring with me, but I forgot. Um, the guidebook, by the way, was never meant to be a comprehensive list of historic resources in the area, just the limited inventory that we can publish in 16 pages. But even then, we've lost many significant areas since its 2012 publication. Um, when the City of New York announced the Gwas rezoning in September 2016, we called on LPC to designate historic districts and or landmarks prior to the rezoning. We participated in the Public Realm Working Group helped found, like the Park Slope Civic Council, the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition. It seems that success has many parents. Um, and we, uh, we, we've we identified several buildings worthy of preservation, five of which Landmarks has committed to pre pre uh, preserving and we have before us today. So I'd like to really thank uh, Council Member Lander uh, for listening to our pleas to get out in front of the rezoning for this and to the Landmarks Commission for also listening to our concern that good planning says practices say that we should figure out what's there first and preserve that before we start talking about how it's all going to change. So this is really a, a terrific example of that happening and we we're really pleased to be part of it and pleased to have such strong uh, partners. I'm not going to repeat what Kate did so wonderfully about these buildings. Uh, it, it's such a pleasure to talk about sewer power and uh, building materials in, instead of just, you know, fancy buildings and, you know, things like the Frick and stuff like that. Um, I would like to mention that of these buildings, um, I believe at least four of them are going to be having new development right cheek by jowl next to them. So this this really is a case where landmarking is not going to stop development of the area. We had some concerns with some of them, which I won't revisit in this 
joyous occasion about uh, public design and, and, and architectural design of what's being planned. Uh, we know that the BRT, that is a long-standing issue. We had concerns about the can factory. Uh, we are in favor of additional development to help continue the can factory's very important role of the neighborhood, but we felt that it should be uh, there should be some level of design. And I can go on at length about the history of tin plate manufacture in New York, but I won't. Um, Again, I, I, I only echo what Peter was saying about this is the beginning. This is a great start for Gowanus and preservation. Um, I'd also like to hook into and dovetail with what Councilmember Lander was talking about, using all the tools possible. Um, you know, signage is great. Naming is great. Plaques are terrific. Best of all is a combination that both uses urban design tools with uh, placemaking with actual preservation for historic properties. So I, I think that we have a chance to rescue um, and preserve the character of Gowanus. Gowanus is radically changing, whether or not it rezones or not. So you, you see it changing. I lived not that far away from the area. And over the last 15 years, it has remarkably changed in some good ways and in some unfortunate ways. Um, so, and it's going to continue changing. I think that with this rezoning, we have a real opportunity to do the best we can for the city. So thank you very much. And we urge you to support these. Thank you very much for your testimony. We really appreciate it. And we uh, certainly appreciate your input um, on, on, this, um, on this history that we've heard today. So thank you for being M here today. Madam Chair, can I ask one quick question? Yes, sir. Thank you. First, I want to thank you for all the advocacy, all the work for this testimony and for reminding us, you know, it's worth taking a moment to remember what's been lost. It is a day of celebration, but I am thinking today about the Kentile floor sign, which was such a loss. I mean, it's sitting in a warehouse, maybe it'll go up again someday, but it came down and, you know, the loss of the coal pockets um, um, and even like at Second Avenue and 9th Street where the building is staying, the loss of the artists from that building. So it's worth, you know, remembering this is something real that is lost when we don't, we aren't able to get out in front. Um, uh, I know you both spoke to some additional buildings, and I certainly, as you know, am, am strongly supportive of continuing to go further with more designations. Um, you may not want to name a few of them since it's a list and we don't necessarily want to, but I, if you want to kind of give my colleagues just a little flavor of some of the other kinds of structures that you're hoping to preserve, then that'll help us, you know, whet the appetites to do even a little more as, as the rezoning, as the rezoning yeah, continues. Included in our list were some uh, small historic districts, so a collection of, of, you know, a relatively small number of buildings. So, um, you know, one of the buildings, uh, uh, the Gowanus pumping station in the guest house, uh, was actually part of what we call the uh, head of the canal historic district, and it took into account. Uh, and, and of course, I should add that the ASPCA building uh, would have uh, also been part of that small historic district. But there are several other buildings um, um, adjacent to those structures. Uh, one of them is the, uh, I want to say the R. H. Dunn building. Am oh, I yeah, getting the R. The, right. R. H. Dunn and Company building. Okay, so this was a precursor of the um, Dunn and Bradstreet Company. And it's a. Um, it's a industrial building with, um, um, you know, a uh, reinforced concrete structure with, I believe, terracotta uh, yes, tile work on it. Uh, so, um, uh, in addition to its industrial character, it's really uh, was a starting point of a major company that's, you know, uh, continues today to play a role in the American economy. Um, there were, if I remember correctly, a couple of other small historic districts. And I think one of the things that's missing today um, in kind of preserving what makes Gowanus special is that it was a combination of industrial activity and the people who worked in these factories and lived a block or two away. So. Um, you know, at the kind of juncture between Gowanus and Carroll Gardens are some uh, modest uh, blocks of row houses. Um, where's, where's Linda live? Is it President Street? Uh, she's on President right. Street, I believe. Yeah. 
Um, so th these are, you know, I think the complete story behind Gowanus is that um, it was a part of New York City where, you know, today we talk about live-work uh, areas. This was perhaps the first live-work community. Uh, you know, I'm not a historian, but it was certainly a prominent example of a live-work community where people uh, live there and, and could walk to work. Uh, and um, the housing stock reflects that character. These are homes of, of a, um, uh, you know, a, a working class communities that uh, we don't, I think, um, give uh, enough um, consideration to when we talk about creating historic districts in New York City. Um, I agree entirely with what Peter said, and also I took a moment and was reminding myself. There are the Ralston buildings, which uh, Councilmember Lander was talking about, um, which really can't be developed much higher than they can be right now. And it's just a question of the very simple but clean buildings that uh, making sure that you don't mess up the, the entrances and the, the windows will make all the difference in the world. Um, there are the buildings on President Street that Peter was referring to. Right across from them is the old Planet Mills uh, condominium, which is a conversion, a very successful co-op conversion of an old industrial site. There is the uh, there's the brewing company on uh, Fourth, the Ice House, House and the Brewing. Bond Street, right? Bond Street, uh, which is a series of complexes of brewing. Uh, the as as the council might know, um, New York used to make a lot of beer. And uh, it doesn't anymore. I mean, we're, we're getting back to it. But uh, there are just these wonderful old buildings that used to employ hundreds and hundreds of people and uh, are still there and still completely functional. So that's another example. Thank you so much. Look forward to continuing to work with you. Great. And thank you for bringing us back in. Thank you for this wonderful perspective uh, on the history of um, one of the finest uh, places uh, in the entire borough of Brooklyn and the city of New York. So again, thank you for your testimony today. Are there any more members of the public who wish to testify on these items? Seeing none, I now close today's hearing and the application will be laid over. I'd like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course, council and land use staff for attending today's hearing. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, Mr.